News of the Times, Murderous Mondays, The Monte Carlo Trunk Murder. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we delve into an international crime thriller from 1907, spanning Monte Carlo, France and England. Via Gould was a handsome, dashing tennis star from Dublin who made the finals of Wimbledon in 1879. Gould also enjoyed the perks of being a star and developed a habit for both alcohol and opium. Upon his defeat at Wimbledon, Gould slowly slides into a dissipated lifestyle. His marriage to Marie Giordain was hoped to turn his life round, but Marie's apparent requirement for the good life continued to drain their finances. As the couple continue to indulge themselves with an an extravagant lifestyle outside their means, they attempt to cheat the casinos in Monte Carlo, which fails. Rich and naive widow Emma Levin, with her obvious wealth, is too much of an attraction and an apparent gift to the ghouls, who are utterly struggling financially. What follows is a dismembered doll used for practice, a bloody and foul-smelling trunk, a naked and dismembered body, and bags of jewels found in Marie's possession. We take a look at the background, the build-up, the crime and the capture of the famous Monte Carlo trunk murder case in today's episode of Murderous Mondays. We hope you enjoy the show. Background Via St. Ledger Gould's prowess on the tennis court was the stuff of legend, captivating audiences with his killer backhand and agile moves. Amidst the aristocratic circles of the British Isles during the 1870s, lawn tennis had emerged as a fashionable pursuit, attracting elites from all walks of life, including Gould, scion of an esteemed Irish lineage, hailing from County Tipperary. Gould's adeptness with a racket was unmatched, earning him acclaim and admiration across Ireland. In the summer of 1879, at the age of 25, Gould's meteoric rise saw him clinch the inaugural Irish Tennis Championships in Dublin, and shortly thereafter he set his sights at the prestigious All England Lawn Tennis and Croquet Club, now known as the Wimbledon Championship. With his golden locks and aristocratic bearing, Gould was popular with the crowds. His tennis style was bold and aggressive, and he was famous for his relentless attacks at the net. He blazed through the Wimbledon tournament, dropping a mere two sets en route to the final showdown. Off court, Gould enjoyed the parties and the limelight. He had a a perchance for revelry and London's nightlife. Gould regularly caroused through the city, taking for granted that he would win in the final. Gould faced Hartley in the final, but the effects of his nocturnal adventures seemed evident as he faltered before his opponent. Succumbing to defeat in the presence of over a thousand spectators. The Wimbledon defeat was just the start of a number of setbacks Gould experienced on and off the court. A year after his Wimbledon appearance, Gould suffered another another blow in the final of the Irish Open, where he was bested by the formidable William Renshaw, a future seven times Wimbledon champion. With his failures on the tennis circuit, Gould's personal fortunes took a darker turn. He succumbed 
to a spiral of alcohol and opium, which turned into addiction. As his addiction tightened its grip, Gould's once promising career dwindled into obscurity. Struggling to cope with mounting gambling debts and the fallout of failed business ventures, he found himself ensnared in misfortune from which he struggled to break free. In 1891, Gould embarked on a new chapter of his life with his marriage to Maria Girardon, a twice-married dressmaker from Montreal. Despite their shared hopes for a prosperous future, their union was soon overshadowed by financial woes. Marie, three years his senior, harboured an appetite for luxury that strained their already precarious finances. Together, the couple ventured into the world of entrepreneurship, opening a dressmaking business in Montreal, as well as several other business ventures, which all failed. Their aspirations were overshadowed by mounting debt, exacerbated by their penchant for lavish European travels and indulgent habits of drinking and gambling. Their dream of financial stability continued to falter under the weight of imprudent choices. Aristocracy Pretensions Driven by Marie's insatiable desire for social assent, the couple embarked on a bold charade in 1902, presenting themselves as Sir and Lady Gould as they traversed the European continent. Their grandiose masquerade was fuelled by Gould's audacious claim of inheriting a baronial title following the supposed demise of his elder brother in a horse-riding accident. However, the truth of this assertion quickly unravelled when it emerged that Gould's brother was alive and thriving in Australia. In an unrelenting pursuit of quick riches, the Goulds next purchased a roulette wheel, convinced that they had devised an infallible system for victory. With this supposed certain gambling system prepared, the couple travelled to Monaco in 1907, where they leased a villa and immersed themselves in the opulent world of Monte Carlo's renowned casino. The ghouls found themselves among the glittering patrons of this playground for royalty and aristocrats. Emma Levin their grand plan to outsmart the casino failed. Instead, the ghouls found themselves destitute. However, fortune smiled upon them when they struck up a friendship with Emma Levin, the widowed spice of a prosperous Swedish merchant. Emma was known for her ostentatious displays of wealth at the casino. Desperate for funds, the ghouls borrowed 1,000 francs from Levin, which they quickly frittered away. August the 4th, 1907, marked the last known appearance of Emma Levin. Emma was invited over for tea to the villa of the ghouls. She was going to collect the debt owed to her before she left Monte Carlo. She was never seen alive again. The bloody trunk. Two days later, as the ghouls disembarked from a train in Marseille en route to London, a porter handling their luggage noticed a foul odour emanating from their trunk. His suspicions were heightened when he observed blood seeping from the trunk. With the ominous odour and the unsettling blood seeping from their luggage, the porter approached the ghouls at the hotel to inquire about the contents. The ghouls' response was to claim that the trunk contained dece deceased poultry. The porter remained unconvinced and insisted 
they accompany him to the police station. Despite their initial refusal and an attempt at bribery, law enforcement was summoned. Upon inspection of the luggage by authorities, the chilling reality of the situation was revealed. Inside the trunk lay the naked and dismembered torso of a woman, while the valise contained the severed head and legs of Emma Levin. Additionally, Levin's jewellery was discovered within Marie's handbag. The two were held for questioning, with Vere Gould's tennis prominence from years before, his claims to a baronessy, and a bloody trunk with the dismembered body of an international jet-setter. The story grabbed the headlines for weeks. From the Daily Mirror, the 10th of August, 1907. Niece's story of locked box room, prisoner and gems, say they were given to his wife by victim. The real baronet, holder of ghoul title, found working as a railway ganger. The next act in the drama of the Grim Trunk Mystery will probably be enacted at Monte Carlo, for the authorities there have applied for the extradition of the ghouls from France. A number of new facts regarding the tragedy were ascertained yesterday. Inquiries in London and elsewhere also revealed much more concerning the past life of the man and woman, who were known as Sevilla and Lady Gould. The woman is said to have been employed at Jay's in Regent Street about 20 years ago. Statements made by the niece of the prisoners to the judicial authorities led to a search being made in a box room at the villa in which they resided in Monte Carlo. Bloodstains were found, and the body of the victim is believed to have been concealed there on the night following the tragedy. Some considerable jewellery is stated to have been found in a bag belonging to Mrs Gould. During examination at Marseille yesterday, Via Gould affirmed that the jewels found in his wife's bag had been given to her by Madame Levin. He again protested his innocence of the crime, but admitted that he had been wrong to cut up the body, owing to a fear of a scandal. The police theory of the case is that the murder was committed in order to obtain possessions of the jewels, said to be worth around about £3,200, worth approximately half a million pounds in 2024, belonging to Madame Levin, who was the widow of a Stockholm gentleman well known in business circles in London, who died at the Hotel Cecil about five years ago. A dismembered doll has been found in a box room at the ghoul's flat, and it is suggested that it was used for experimental dissection after the murder. A cabled message from Adelaide in South Australia announced the discovery of the whereabouts of the real holder of the Gould title, Sir James S. Gould Bart. It is stated he is to be employed as a railway ganger and has not heard from his brother Via for years. Prisoners before Magistrate Via Gould and his wife are now under arrest at Marseille. After the repeated interrogations to which the couple have been submitted and the discrepancies in their statements to which the judicial authorities have drawn their attention, they have been shown that it will be very hard for them to prove their innocence, which they still assert, of the terrible crime of which they are accused. This morning, Via Gould was taken from prison and conducted to the Palace of Justice, and there again examined by Monsieur Malaval, the magistrate in charge of the case. When asked to explain the origin of the jewels which the police had found in a bag belonging to Mrs. Gould, he said, they were given to his wife by Madame Levin, 
the murdered woman on some day before the crime. He added that the victim, Emma Levin, was in need of money and asked them to dispose of her jewellery. In the course of further examination, Gould emphatically denied all participation in the crime. He admitted, however, that he had done wrong in cutting up the body, but asserted that he had only done so to avoid a scandal. And at the end of the examination, Gould was taken back to prison. As he left the Palace of Justice, the crowd which had gathered outside shouted, Kill him! Kill him! And had it not been for the intervention of the gendarmes, he would certainly have been lynched. The criminal authorities at Monte Carlo have made a formal request for the extradition of the Englishman and his wife. Stains on the floor. Up to the present, it had been supposed that the body of the victim passed the night of Sunday to Monday in the bathroom at the villa at Monte Carlo, but the police have found a little dark cupboard bearing blood stains on the floor and linen marked with blood, and it is supposed that the body was placed in this cupboard after the crime. The Englishman and his wife are at present detained in separate cells, and Mrs. Gould is greatly distressed at being separated from her husband. She frequently asks after him, inquiring if he had been examined and what he said. She also asks if he is getting plenty of whiskey. If he does not, she said, he will die, and she has offered to pay for whiskey for him. At Monte Carlo, the ghouls are stated to have been confirmed gamblers. Lady Gould, in particular, used to spend hours at the tables while her husband waited for her in the gardens of the casino. Dismembered Doll On making a fresh and more minute search in the Gould's apartments, in an unclosed box in a room, two dolls were discovered, one of which was decapitated, its arms and legs cut off, were placed apart. It is supposed that experiments have been made with it by the murderer or murderers of Madame Levin. A former tennis champion, Via St. Ledger Gould, who was secretary to the Municipal Boundaries Commission in Ireland, which sat in 1881 and 1882, was a well-known member of the Fitzwilliam Lawn Tennis Club. He left in the 80s owing a good deal of money, and his creditors have been at a loss to ascertain his whereabouts since then. To a Bagot Street tobacconist, he owed about £50 for cigars. As a lawn tennis player, he had a deadly backhand stroke, and once won the Irish Championship under the name of St. Ledger. The Victim, a Woman of Wealth The Daily Mirror gathered some important details in London yesterday concerning Monsieur Leopold Levin, the victim's husband, who died at the Hotel Cecil while on a business visit to England about five years ago. Monsieur Levin was at the time of his death manager of Lucas Levin and Co., which was formerly known as the Ferraria Company, engineers of Stockholm. He was an exceedingly keen businessman and, in addition, was re recognised as one of the leaders of Stockholm society, while his wife was regarded as a charming and excellent companion for him. Monsieur Levin acquired a considerable sum of money at his business and he and his wife lived in rather an ostentatious style. She was especially fond of jewels, and her fingers invariably sparkled with costly gems whenever she and her husband appeared at a public dinner or entertainment. For two or three years after the bereavement she lived quietly on the substantial income which her husband had left her, 
She travelled on the continent, and the Riviera being her favourite resort, as she found that it was most beneficial to her health. Case in a nutshell. Here are the facts of the mysterious tragedy in a nutshell. The victim was Emma Erika Levin, a Swedish woman aged 37, widow of Monsieur Levin of Stockholm. She frequented Monte Carlo and was fond of jewellery. The accused are Via Gould, brother of Sir James S. Gould, an Irish baronet of Adelaide, South Australia. Mrs. Gould was well known in the West End as a court dressmaker. The crime was committed on Sunday at the Gould's house. The mangled remains of the victim were found in a trunk at Marseille Station the next day. Mr. and Mrs. Gould were arrested there. A dagger and evidence of the murder afterwards were found in their rooms at Monte Carlo. The story makes the international headlines. Scotland Yard are called on by the French authorities requesting background information about the couple. Monte Carlo starts up an extradition request from France. Trunk Mystery, Life of the Ghouls Scotland Yard authorities ask to obtain information about prisoners for the Continental Police. Evidently, one of the chief points that is now occupying the Continental Police in connection with the unravelling of the mis mysteries of the trunk crime is the discovery of as much as can be ascertained by the life led by the ghouls while they resided in England and elsewhere. With this object in view, the French authorities have appealed to Scotland Yard to obtain information. This is, of course, the common practice in criminal cases. The Gould Gambling System Some further details of the Gould's life at Monte Carlo also came to light yesterday. It appears that Mrs Gould had a gambling system. This information was given by a gentleman now at Margate who lived for about three years in Monte Carlo and he knew the Goulds well and visited them. From investigations, evidence is discovered proving that the jewels found in the possession of Mrs Gould belonged in fact to Mrs Levin, with pictures produced by her family members showing Mrs Levin wearing the very jewellery found in the possession of Mrs Gould at her capture. The Goulds are held on remand but placed in separate cells. In a feeble attempt to deflect blame, the couple initially provided law enforcement with a dubious narrative. They asserted that Levant's demise occurred at the hands of her lover, who purportedly stormed into their villa and perpetrated the act in their presence. Continuing this attempted narrative, the ghouls state that they were fearful of entanglement in the unfolding tragedy. They confessed to dismembering Levin's body, but adamantly denied involvement in her murder. However, the validity of their account was swiftly undermined by visible bruises on Marie's person, suggestive of a recent altercation, further casting doubt on their credibility. The story of an alleged crazed lover of Mrs. Levin does not last long. In a startling reversal, Gould ultimately assumed full responsibility for the grim deed. He recounted to authorities a harrowing tale of confrontation, disclosing that a dispute over an outstanding debt culminated in a violent altercation. According to his testimony, he approached Levin while she leisurely indulged in cherry liqueur within the confines of their villa. With deadly force, Gould wielded a pestle delivering a fatal blow to her skull, 
before grappling with her in a frantic struggle. Subsequently, he confessed to repeatedly stabbing Levin with a knife. The sickening crime details are added to with Gould confessing to strategically disposing of Levin's abdominal organs on the nearby beach. He then meticulously dismembered her remains within the confines of their bathroom, all in a bid to conceal his ghastly crime. However, the French police are unconvinced by Gould's tale and believe that the reality is that Mrs. Gould oversaw the killing, and the statements of the two show deep inconsistencies. From the Lloyd's Weekly newspaper, the 18th of August, 1907, Trunk Murder Confessed. The ghouls tell how Emma Levin died. Tissue of lies. The terrible crime discovered at the railway station at Marseille when the terribly mutilated corpse of a woman was found in a large trunk consigned to London from which blood was issuing has been followed by a confession of guilt. After several stormy examinations, Madame Gould has told what she claims to be the truth concerning the death of the unfortunate Emma Levin, casting upon her husband the whole responsibility of the murder and the subsequent dismemberment of the body. Via Gould, with the docility of weakness, has accepted her version, but their confessions palpably differ in detail, and the authorities consider that the full story has yet to be elicited. Gould's behaviour in prison has raised the question of his sanity. In an excess of desperation, he violently attacked his fellow prisoners who had been placed in the same cell to guard him. Confessions of Murder Madame Gould says her husband alone is guilty of Emma Levin's death. Full of dramatic surprises, as the unravelling of the Monte Carlo trunk tragedy has been, that which Tuesday brought was the greatest of all, for both Mr. and Mrs. Gould confessed that Madame Levin was murdered, with Mrs. Gould asserting that her husband alone was responsible for the deed a responsibility which he unhesitatingly accepted. Mrs. Gould said, I will tell the whole truth. It was my husband alone who murdered Madame Levin. This is how the crime was committed. My husband was on that day very excited, having drunk great quantities of whiskey, according to his habit. I was in my bedroom. All at once I heard a terrible cry. Thinking that my husband had had one of his fits, I rushed into the dining room and was horrified when I saw my husband with his shirt sleeves turned up and his hand with blood on it standing in front of the body of his victim. I uttered a cry of horror. The features of my husband were so terribly convulsed that I was afraid, and rushed back into my room where I was overcome with tears. When I recovered, I went back to the dining room where I found my husband sitting prostrate in an armchair. I told him I should tell the manager of the casino of the crime. He begged me to do nothing of the kind, and pointed to the scandal that would arise. Thinking of my niece, who was absent from the house at the time, and for whom I have a great love, I took his advice, and went to fetch a big trunk in which I used to keep things. I dragged it near the body, and before my husband put the body into the trunk, I asked him why he committed the crime. He answered, She came to borrow money from me, and when I refused, she became disagreeable, and even threatened me. It was then that I struck her. Mrs. Gould went on to say that her husband cut the body up, unassisted, and took no part in it. As a matter of fact, she kept to her room all day, being unable to look at the corpse. Her husband told her 
that the dissecting was done in the bathroom. It was only in the evening that my husband told me that he had decided to leave at once for Marseille, where he said that it would be easy to get rid of the remains. I decided that it was best for me to follow what my husband ordered, and that very evening we started for Marseille. After having told my niece that the object of the journey was to get medical attendance for my husband. At twelve o'clock at night, we left Monte Carlo and we arrived at Marseille at 5.30 a.m. in the morning with the fatal trunk and the bag. With Mrs. Gould placing the whole of the crime on the shoulders of her husband and Via Gould equally accepting full responsibility, French police remain unconvinced and believe that the real murderer behind the crime was Mrs. Gould herself. Amidst the unfolding investigation, police harboured suspicions that Gould might be shielding his wife from culpability. They speculate that the genesis of the murder plot might have stemmed from Marie's leveraging her influence over her husband. Investigators surmise that Marie, with her alleged perchance for extravagance, could have orchestrated the heinous act. From the Ottawa Free Press, the 24th of August, 1907, police find flaws in Gould's story. French police are probing into strange death of Emma Levin in Monte Carlo. Dramatic stories of the Monte Carlo trunk murder have been told to the examining magistrates at Marseille by Via St. Ledger Gould and his wife. Withdrawing his assertion that the murder was committed by a third person, Gould confessed that Emma Levin died by his hand alone. The substance of the confession is that she asked Gould to lend her 100 francs to accommodate a young man to whom she had taken a fancy. When he refused, she abused him. He lost his temper, seized a dagger, and killed her in a fit of blind fury. This version is considered unconvincing. The first improbability is in the assertion of Gould's wife that she being in a negligee costume and not expecting visitors, left Emma Levin with Gould, whereas the victim came to the house at five o'clock in the afternoon, in consequence of an invitation to tea. She didn't make a casual call. The Gould woman also asserted that she became insensible when she saw the body, but the neighbours say she appeared on the balcony of the house and remained there a few minutes immediately after the Levant woman's voice was heard the last time. A further fact tending to disprove Gould's assertion is that his victim needed money, is that she paid her hotel bill the day before her death and left 140 francs in cash and valuable jewellery in a drawer, whereas the Gould's possessed hardly any money, and had considerable debts. Their portable property was worth barely 300 francs. The murder and motive being thus established, the only important point remaining for elucidation is the relative degree of guilt. All the evidence tends to show that Gould was entirely under his wife's influence. He never displayed the least initiative. Drink always depressed him. No one ever saw him in a state of alcoholic fury to which the accused attributes his crime. The theory of the prosecution is that the murder was thought out by the woman who persuaded the man that the only way out of their money difficulties was to kill Emma Levin, dispose of her body, and obtain her valuables. The victim, Emma Levant, was known as an easy-going woman, always ready to make friends 
somewhat vain and fond of display. The ghouls knew that if she accepted an invitation to their house, she would be certain to wear plenty of jewellery. One theory is that the ghouls tried to make her sign a promissory note and killed her on her refusal in order to obtain the jewellery she wore, which was valued at £5,000 and was afterwards found in their possession. The investigation of these points is likely to occupy the Marseille magistrates for a considerable time. The question of the transfer of the prisoners to Monaco is still undecided, owing to the difficulty of ascertaining the Gould's woman's nationality and whether she and Gould were ever married. A further obstacle is the unwillingness of those who knew the parties at Monte Carlo to give evidence all betray a strong desire not to be mixed up in the case. The victim herself, Emma Levant, was one of the most singular personalities in the affair. She belonged to a class of women who, although quite respectable, loved to be regarded as a demi-mondaine. She gambled at the Monte Carlo Casino habitually and often remained in a well-known café until 2am in the morning. Friends repeatedly warned her against making promiscuous acquaintances, but the attraction of appearing to live a dissipated life proves too strong for her. Via Gould Late last night Gould suddenly jumped out of bed, hammered frantically at the door, and clamoured for help against imaginary enemies, who, he said, were trying to cut off his legs and put them in a sack. This morning, when he was allowed to see his lawyer, he was seized with another fit of fury and attacked his visitor with his fists. The lawyer now declines to see his client again. Gould's condition will be used in his trial in support of a plea that he is a madman. The highly publicised trial, branded by the media as the Monte Carlo trunk murder, captivated audiences globally. The macabre details of the crime, coupled with its ties to the upper echelons of society, rendered it an irresistible spectacle. Consequently, Gould found himself propelled to newfound notoriety, far eclipsing the recognition he had garnered from his exploits on the tennis court. The evidence that had been placed before the magistrates is repeated in the trial. Interestingly, it is Mrs. Gould, as perceived planner and instigator, who is given the maximum penalty. From the Daily Mirror, the 5th of December 1907, sentences on the Goulds. Wife condemned to death, husband to hard labour for life. Scenes in court. Madame faints when reminded of Via Gould's mad love for her. Madame Gould is sentenced to death and her husband, Via Gould, to hard labour for life. This was the verdict declared this evening at the conclusion of the trial for the ghastly murder of Madame Emma Levan at the Villa Messanine at the beginning of August. Today's proceedings were taken up with the speeches of the counsel for the prosecution and the defence, all the evidence having been taken on the previous day. Madame Gould's composure had entirely broken down when the hearing was resumed this morning, and instead of the calm, self-possessed attitude she had displayed previously, she appeared thoroughly broken in spirit and no longer mistress of herself. It was as though she understood for the first time that the verdict must go against her, but even she hardly realised that her sentence would be more severe than her husband's, whom she had used as her tool. Madame Gould had three days in which to appeal against her sentence. Madame Gould in tears Madame Gould had a bad night, and today she was as white as a sheet. 
it was evident that she was at the end of her strength, and all her courage had gone. While she sat on the bench, tears rained down her face, and her veil was wet with moisture. Vera Gould was, perhaps, a trifle paler than yesterday, but he remained impassive and calm. Madame Gould turned her back to the audience, but the husband looked around in an aimless sort of way. At the beginning of today's sitting, Monsieur Alain, Advocate General, addressed the court for the public prosecutor. Mademoiselle Giondin, the Gould's niece, was excused from being present. Monsieur Alain's speech was a severe indictment of both the accused, whom he represented as a couple of adventurers who were living at hazard and were not over-scrupulous in the methods they employed. While he spoke with much dramatic force and skill, Gould kept his eyes fastened upon him, but Madame Gould sat motionless as a statue. Loved his wife madly. The speech of Monsieur Alain produced a great effect on the audience, which was largely composed of women. While he charged the ghouls with premeditation and with having lured their victim into a trap, Madame Gould wept copiously and asked for water. A minute later, when the Advocate General pronounced the words Gould loved his wife madly, she uttered a cry and fell into the arms of a police officer. A medical man at once went to her assistance, and her husband leaned anxiously towards her. Madame Gould's counsel advised her to be calm. I will try, she replied, faintly. Finally, she was given ether to inhale and recovered. She betrayed much emotion on hearing the public prosecutor demand the death sentence. Plea for mercy. The audience applauded the orator, but the judge at once called them to order. After the usual suspension for luncheon, Monsieur Kuhneman addressed the court for Via Gould. He protested with vehemence against capital punishment, which had been abolished in other countries by the force of public opinion, and implored mercy of the judges. Monsieur Barbering, speaking on behalf of Madame Gould, said he was obliged to defend his client against public opinion. She stood alone. Her friends had deserted her, her adopted daughter had denounced her, and the crowd was clamouring for her death. He denied her participation in the crime, and after also protesting against capital punishment, besought the pity of her judges. After the long speeches of counsel, the tribunal retired, and after a deliberation lasting two hours, returned at 7.15. In a hard voice, the President delivered the terrible verdict. Gould took it fairly well, but Madame, on whom the heaviest blow fell, gave a piercing cry. I am innocent, and fell fainting to the floor. With the court's verdict, both Gould and his wife were convicted of murder. Madame Gould, deemed the mastermind behind the crime, received the more severe punishment, death by guillotine. However, Monarchan authorities hesitated to carry out the execution, particularly when she insisted on being beheaded in front of Monte Carlo's prestigious casino. Recognising the adverse impact such a public spectacle would have on the resort's reputation, officials commuted her sentence to life imprisonment. Madame Gould ultimately passed away in a French prison in 1914. As for the former Wimbledon finalist, he was exiled to Devil's Island in French Guiana for his role in the murder. Once accustomed to rubbing shoulders with the elite, Gould now shared his days with thieves, political dissidents and fellow convicts. Unable to bear 
the harsh conditions of the penal colony. Gould took his own life on September the 8th, 1909. That concludes this episode of Murderous Mondays, the Monte Carlo Trunk Murder. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy this show, we would be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful, where we look at crimes in a location such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. If you like this channel, you may be interested in our sister channel, Chronicle of the Times, where we offer a lighter side of Victorian and Edwardian news stories, as well as a weekly podcast of stories from authors of the day, such as Dickens, Collins, Benson and Conan Doyle. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles. <laughs>